It's Michael Herrera with MHA Consulting, and we welcome you to our BCM Leadership Series. And today we welcome you to getting the most out of your vendor search, the do's and don'ts of RFPs. MHA Consulting now embarks on its 23rd year. I started the firm back in 1999. Uh, prior to that was a regional vice president with Bank of America. And since then, we have now grown significantly from just myself to over 15 people in our consulting firm and are working not just domestically, but on a global level. And in that time, we have established a very diverse global client base. We have worked across most, if not all of the major industries with global leaders. I will tell you this, if there's something we've seen is we have probably seen in the 23 years, every type of RFP manageable. Those that have been easy to work with, those that have been very complex, those that are totally unmanageable, and those that you honestly, you don't have a clue what they're asking for. So we've seen every type of RFP. And we've also worked with every type of organization. Those organizations that issue RFPs that simply want to check the box, those that actually want something to be done to be workable and executable, and then those others that don't have a clue. So hopefully in today's webinar, we'll talk about what we see in RFPs, what type of information you should place in your RFP, what the level of comprehensiveness should be, how you need to work with a consultant. So in the end, what is most important, you pick the right firm and the firm knows exactly what you're looking to do. In the end, they meet your goals and ensure you have a higher level of capability in your programs. Here's some very common recovery uh, requests for proposal trends that we see. What do we see out there? What have we seen? Well, first and foremost, I will tell you, in many cases, it's very clear from the request for proposal or just in discussion with these individuals, what they're looking for is they have no idea what business continuity management is and what the need is at their organization. If you don't know what business continuity management is, it's gonna be pretty difficult to write a request for proposal or ask for services that make sense. Secondly, no idea what business continuity is gonna cost in not only in time, time not only from the consulting firm, from time of the organization, what it's going to cost from, from an investment in money. Is this going to be a tens of thousands? Is this going to be a, over a hundred thousand? What is the potential cost going to be? And most important, what's it going to also cost from a, from a perspective of resources internally, as well as from the consultant side. Next, many of the cases we find in this request for proposal trends, we see people don't follow their own timelines. For example, they'll say, we're going to send this out for, we'll have your the request for proposal sent to you in two weeks. Two weeks will pass, three weeks will pass, four weeks will pass. Then you get to the point of when it's due, you submit the request for proposal. You're waiting for them to find, make a final selection and hold final interviews. Most do not follow their own timelines. No, we understand as consultants, that at times things change or there's competing, competing activities. But please do your best. That's what we see is one of the, 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 the trends that we don't like to see. People don't follow their own timelines. This one, RFP directions are confusing, disorganized. You don't know which way. Who's, who's on first? I will tell you. Uh, produce this type of deliverable. No, don't produce that type of deliverable. Although use a different terminology that, again, has nothing to do with, with business continuity management. Unrealistic timelines. There, where you're being asked to complete specific tasks and activities that, for example, you know there's no way you're going to be able to complete that in 60 days or 90 days. Because again, it all goes back to that first bullet. No clear understanding what business continuity is, how what the need is, and what does that mean from a time, money, and resources perspective. Management does not have an approved budget. That is the one that always concerns us the most. And that's why a lot of times you'll see in requests for proposals and, and questions that are sent back to the to the prospective uh, customer, do you have an approved budget? We've actually been in, in before when requests for proposals have been issued and, and all of the responses come back, where you'll just get an answer back that this is gonna cost, this costs too much. So it's really important that by knowing what business continuity is, some ideas how big this can be, uh, ideas when we need to implement this, that that way then too you can go and get off some idea of an approved budget. This is what we think we need. Do we need 20,000? Do we need 50,000? Do we need 200,000? But at least management will have that and have it approved so that when you do make a selection, there's no question it can be done. Here's a funny one. There have been times that we've actually done requests for proposals that as a professional, a subject matter expert in business continuity, I have left 
reading the request for proposal so confused that I actually, one, question what I know about business continuity, and I leave their questioning what is exactly they need. And those are the requests for proposals that I will tell you now, after doing this for 23 years, building up a very solid set of clients globally, that there's times that I have nothing that I want to do with that particular client request for proposal. It's much easier to say, no, thank you, than to attempt to spend our time, money, and resources in producing a response that you hope may meet their needs. Now, and then lastly, here's one. Clients think that they will be your only client. People have to remember when you're a successful firm and you're out there working, not just domestically, globally, across many industries, your consultants are not sitting waiting. They're not sitting waiting for the next request for proposal. If that is the case, you probably don't want to bring them on board. But clients and prospective clients have to understand, you know what, they're not the only client. So as they issue these requests for proposals, they have to understand that they also have to work with the consultant and work within their allocation timelines with whoever they select. Now, very important, starting your business continuity project off on the right foot. Definitely vendors are not one size fits all. Companies are not one size, right, fits all. So you need to do some research. Let's talk a little bit about things you need to consider. On your side, you need to consider what's the size of our company? Are we a small, medium, or, or very large, complex organization? What is the level of complexity? You know, are we just a, a one building facility? But or are we a 50 uh, facility company with global global entities running all over the country, all over the world? What's our geography? Like I just said, are we just domestic global or are we everywhere? Do we have a language issue? Do we need to make sure that whoever we hire needs to speak multiple languages or is English the primary language? What's the level of maturity of our business continuity program? Is it we don't have a clue or is it we just need more refinement? We need you to find where we're at and make some changes to make us better. So know what your maturity level is from a business continuity perspective. And then lastly, understanding based on size, complexity, geography, language, and maturity, what's the scope? What exactly, how big is the bread box that we're going to be asking prospective consultants to look at? That's really important you understand who you are, what you're looking for, what are the, all the intricacies that this consultant's going to need to work with when they come to you. So have a clear understanding of that. And then what, based on that, go off and do some research. Go off and find the vendors. Do research on the vendors. Probably with some of the best RFPs we have responded to have been those where the prospective client has already done and cut the list down to the top three, the top four. So that when you come in, they've already searched. They know who your clients are. They know what reviews have been out there about you. They know what services you provide. And they basically, based on what they've seen and what they've investigated, they know you're one of the top three to four that, you know what, we don't, we don't have to have you go over everything you do, how you do it, who your clients are. We've already done our pre-work on you and you're already in that, that final set that they can now more focus on really getting down to brass tacks. But here's what you need. When you go out and look at potential consulting firms, Look at their level of experience. Have they been in business for one year, five years, 20 years? How many years have they been out there? And as part of that experience, are they really good at what they do? Because a lot of times people will also say, well, what about size? What if it's a smaller continuity firm versus larger firm? You need to consider that. And a lot of times the smaller firms, uh, the smaller boutique firms, guess what? They're more adaptable, flexible, speedy. Uh, they're gonna get things done quicker, faster. OK, but there may be times you need a larger firm just simply because of your complexity, your geography. Maybe you need somebody who has global offices that speak multiple languages. But again, that's going to be really important. What's their level of experience? What's their size, size that makes sense for you? You know, MHA, we're kind of that unique boutique consulting firm that when they look at the size of our firm and they see this level of clients we work with, some people are like, wow, how do you do that? Well, it has a lot to do with the level of experience of our people our tools, our methodology that allow us to work across many, many clients uh, across the globe. Whereas a lot of smaller boutique firms cannot do that. So you have to consider that all in. And then most important look and experience, do they get the job done? How adaptable are they? they can, can they do things, you know, the, can they do things that are outside the box? 
We have a lot of clients that ask for things that, you know what, it follows industry standards and best practices, but we have to think outside the box how we're going to apply it. You need to have that in a vendor. Can they say, okay, yes, I need you to do it this way, but you know what, we need to do it a little bit differently because that's how it fits in with the culture. Know that their brand, again, is also commensurate with you because, again, culture is very important. Make sure that the brand and the culture of the, of the consulting firm fits yours. Also, price. Um, I will just say this, just like anything else. You don't want the cheapest and you don't necessarily need the most expensive. You need that, that firm that, you know what, definitely they're going to cost you. But you're going to know that because of their experience, their brand, their speed, adaptability, they're going to they're going to do what's right. And you're going to feel confident the product you're going to receive is, again, commensurate with not only what you need and more importantly, it's going to be executable. And then lastly, make sure that this vendor has some access to some systems, you know, whether from a business continuity perspective, instead of providing you just with a whole file worth of files, worth of Excel sheets and, and Word, MS Word, can they provide you with some access to systems they have that allow them to automate this all for you? So in the end, you can decide, do I want to keep what they have or do I want everything back? But automate makes this not only just today, but going into the future that you have access to that information that makes your job easier. So do your work ahead of time. Go and find three to five of those firms. Do your work on them. Make sure you can cut that list down and say, okay, I already know who they are. I've already done my background. Let's move to what's important, which is letting them respond to our RFP. So very important. We see this every day. I'll give you an example. Right now on our pipeline, we have 30, we have almost 30 different opportunities in addition to the, to the many uh, uh, engagements we're already on. Here's what we see. Very important. Use recognized business continuity terminology and methodology with consistent how they're used in the industry. Many times people will use terms and different wording that doesn't make, I will be honest with you, has nothing to do with their industry and makes no sense as to what they're asking for. Be clear and logical in your need. Is it what your organization needs right now? Or maybe in the future? You know, do you need a business impact analysis? Or does a current state assessment make more sense? Because at least we can tell you where you're at. And from there, come up with a roadmap that long-term will make sure you have more effective use of time, money, and resources. So you need to know what is the real need you have right now? Do you have a need to meet customer needs? We have a lot of clients today They've never had a plan before and they're needing to meet that immediate need. I need you to write a plan for me in order to meet our customer needs. So be very clear and logical on what you need. Take the time to understand it. Take the time to have the proper terminology so that when you send the RFP out, the consultant can see it and understand it, okay? So very important, number three, understand what you're requesting. Understand what you are requesting. If you are asking for a business impact analysis and a business continuity plan, you should know at least at a high level what a business impact analysis is and what a business continuity plan is. I can't say this enough. We get many, many where we end up doing, again, a business continuity 101 uh, as part of initial conversation or discussions with that prospective client so we can have them understand what they're asking for. So it's really important you take the time on the front end to at least have a high level understanding amongst your selection team. What is a business impact analysis? What is a business continuity plan? And most importantly, how is it going to be applied at our organization? I had a call yesterday with an organization out of New York City. It was wonderful because this, this individual had taken the time. He was head of compliance. He had taken the time to, do, to, to go out and really figure out what is business continuity? What does it mean? And then most importantly, how am I gonna apply it in my organization? So that as he provided me with a deck, he provided me with a short deck as to what he knew, what business continuity needed to be in his organization and what he was looking for. Made our job so much easier. It allowed me to pinpoint what he needed and then to give him very accurate estimate on time, money, and resources, what that was going to be. Okay. Lastly, your RFP needs to make sense because here's what's going to happen. You need to make sure that when you have that list of suppliers that you're considering for business continuity, you want to make sure that they can document a response that you can line up and it's apples to apples. And it's very appropriate and consistent with your need so that when you get it all back, you can go, OK, you know, they're all looking at it the same way. Here's the, the, the estimates and time, money and resources. And you're able to say, OK, based on what I see, this is the one I'll pick. So very important. You take the time and you step back. Make sure your RFP makes sense. Okay, 
we kind of already talked about this, but knowing what you need is, is not as simple as it sounds, right? Know what you need, know what kind of goals you're trying to achieve. So if you need a business impact analysis, what are the goals out of that? We want to know what's critical from a, from a business unit perspective in their processes. We want to know what the criticality of our systems is. We need to know timeframes for recovery, recovery points. Know what you're asking for. So that there's no question as you hand it out and the consultants bring back the deliverables, it aligns with what you're looking for. Now, if you're lucky enough and you know what you already need, you're ready to go, right? If you've already looked at it, I got my goals, my objectives, my scope, et cetera. Boy, that's fantastic. And you can start to write that request for proposal. Now, if not, take a pause, right? Very important. Maybe you need to consider creating an RFP focus on just getting help to determine what is it we need. In the end, for many people, that will end up saving them so much time, money, and resources versus just going off and saying, uh, you know what? I have a leak. I have a leak in my house. Just replace all of my plumbing. Versus saying, come back and tell me exactly where do you think that is? And let's work from here to find out where the issue is versus going off and doing, trying to get boil the ocean and do everything at once. Okay. Now, or as well, when you're starting to do this, consider starting small in the request, to either with an assessment or a small BI, something to get you going that is easy to understand, easy to get going. And most importantly, show some success and some early wins. This will lead to better results over time because a lot of times what happens is many times people will ask for a lot. They want you to boil the ocean. You come back with this estimate and time, money, and resources. And they're like, we can't do this. This is way too much. Now, identify the size, scope, and timing of the engagement. Please let us know how big the project is. Is this going to be one facility that we're looking at? Is it going to be all of our facilities across the globe? Is it just a part of a company? Is this only operations? Is it only technology or is it everything? Make sure you're able to say, if you've got, you're starting to write it and you say, gosh, we're going to do a business impact analysis and we're also going to need to write plans for our applications. You should be able to say, okay, this is how many business units this will entail and be able to understand how many that is in their name. How many business impact analysis you actually want from those business units? And then how many, for example, how many applications need a plan? Be as specific as possible. That really helps a consultant to at least say, you know what, you've given me a number, but I can give you a range. So that, that way, then if numbers are different than actuals, you know what, you've got an idea what it'll cost. And it gives you some idea for time, money, and resources. Very important, because in the end, this really, for most people, again, it becomes that cost, right? It becomes that hard dollar cost as to what this will be. So if you can be more accurate, you're going to get better numbers back. And then you're also better to analyze what does it take each consultant to do and which one makes most sense for us, Okay. Also understand, when is this engagement scheduled to start and end? When is it scheduled to start and end? Again, really simple. But remember, you as a prospective client also have to take in consideration the consultants. Guess what? I don't, at least at MHA, I don't have consultants sitting on the bench. We have been blessed that, you know what? Our staff is busy. And, but we have to, again, understand when you want things to, to start and end that's realistic so that I can begin to say, yes, I can allocate them I can't allocate them in February, but I sure as heck can alloc allocate them at the end of March. We need to understand what this means starting and ending. That's realistic because again, good consulting firms don't have a lot of consultants sitting there waiting for work. All right, please state any limitations or restrictions. Not only should you state what is to be done, but what, all, what isn't. It's great when they say this particular business continuity engagement starts in the operations area and ends there. It doesn't go into it doesn't go into manufacturing, doesn't go into compliance, legal, et cetera. This is the only area we're looking at. Or it is all of the organization, and this is what that that entails. Are there any limitations on budget? That's also, of course, nobody ever wants you to know that. But it, it's always helpful if you can, because again, if you have a good consulting firm, and I think this is something that I that you want to say after doing this for 23 years and working where I have most good consulting firms, they're not out there to do anything. They're not out there to rip you off from a budget perspective. That's good consulting firms that have great brands. That's not what we're out there to do. We're out there to do what's right, but we also have to work within a budget that makes sense. Uh, in today's world is travel required. We are starting to see again, some clients are asking us for travel specifically in highly complex engagements. Uh, those that require us to do, assessments of, of data centers, of co-location facilities, 
of alternate work sites where we're actually assessing the capabilities. Those are now starting to see some travel. But and if you do travel, just so when, when and where and what are you again, how do you handle travel? That's really important. Um, as there are things that we should stop or skip, right? So again, that goes hold back to kind of giving me where, what do I need to do? What do I, don't I need to do? Do I need to go or can I do this virtually? This really helps us as we're creating this proposal because it also helps us determine, you know what? There's some of my team because of their, their current engagements, they can't travel, but they could get the work done from home. So again, it really helps us as all these limitations or restrictions kind of just giving us how big the bread box is so that we can plan appropriately and most importantly, give you an excellent response back to your request for proposal. Now, oh, this is the one here. Thankfully, we have moved to the electronic age. Uh, years ago, when we first started, again, back in 99 at, at MHA, so many of our RFP responses had to be, you know, this very defined, uh, you know, this many margins, footers, exactly what was there. And then you had to, you know, get them printed a certain way. And then again, sent them all out. You know, they had to be all sent out by FedEx or in those days before you need to make sure, could you get it there in time? In today's world, again, it's nice to have a nice, easy to understand format, but you can send everything electronically. Now, we had recently a, a, a client in Bahrain that we won. And guess what? They still follow the very traditional rules of having to send so many out in some different formats. And we had to ship everything there and get it there in time for review. Thankfully, we won that engagement recently, but it still was the old school, which we hadn't done in a while. So very important. So when you create your response and what you're looking for, first, I will say, if you've done your research on prospective firms and you feel confident that they're, these are the best to meet your need, a lot of the stuff in your, in your request for proposal doesn't have to be who are your clients, what, what makes you different, um, who are your clients. All these things can be bypassed because you've already done research. You already know you've got the best of the best that you want to work with. So your, your RFP can really be about how will you attack the engagement that I'm asking you from a scope, from an objectives, uh, things I'm asking you to do to not do. So you can see it clears it all up and we don't have to, as consultants, be wasting time on, well, what really makes us different? Who are your clients? This is all information that good firms already have on their sites. You can see what they have and if they can meet your need. So by doing that, it cleans up the response. Keep the RFP um, proposal that you're looking for easy. Make sure you ask us, tell me first, what is the summary of the project or the engagement? How would you handle it? Then tell me, ask me, get into more of a, what is the approach you're going to use? How are you going to attack these 150 BIAs and 50 business continuity plans, uh, DR testing, et cetera? Whatever you're asking, asking me, ask me for a summary, then ask me for that detailed approach. It should be logical and easy for you to understand, but ask me that. Then ask me, well, based on what, how you, from a summary perspective, how you're going to do it, from a detailed perspective, now tell me what the timeline is. Give me a detailed timeline. What are you going to do from beginning to end? And give me a timeline on all the key tasks. Not all the minutia. Give me the high level key tasks that really will show me as a potential client. You understand what you're doing. You have a logical approach to how you're going to attack it and how you're going to finish it. All right. The big one. What's the estimated? I hate to say cost. I always say estimated investment because business continuity is really an investment, right? It's an investment. So what is the estimated cost based on the scope of the objectives? All those things you're asking, what is the estimated cost? And then lastly, of course, you're going to ask for references, right? Uh, and again, please be realistic. You know, I thankfully at MHA, I will say we have a 100% plus referenceable client list. There, I can go back to clients I had five years ago and ask for a reference. But also you have to remember, well, you also have to be just ask for a couple of references. I've actually had uh, RFPs before that have asked for, not only do I need to give them five references, but I need to get a letter from each of those five an actual letter that's signed by the, by the client, by the past client. So it's unreasonable, it's ridiculous. So ask for references and make sure again, yeah, you, you're gonna want at least two to three references that they can call. Uh, of course, we're all gonna give you our best references, right? Um, but again, be prepared when you talk to those references, have some good questions for them. Uh, make sure you can ask some good questions that you feel comfortable that you've gotten the response you want to say, gosh, yeah, the, these are the ones. All right. Give consultants enough time to document the response. 
Remember, we also have other clients. If we don't have other clients, you probably don't want to hire us. Okay. Um, we recently were working on, a, on an engagement and the project manager was like, Michael, I just cannot believe you. You have this many engagements running. He asked me how many engagements you have running and how, and, and also, you know, how do, how do our, how do your consultants work multiple engagements at once? I said, that's just our approach as always has been, always will be. Um, they have to remember when you're again, good consulting firms, they have other clients and they're going to fit you in and work with you to get it done. They don't have people just sitting there waiting. All right. Last thing I always ask people this, could you step back? And, and if you had to step back and look at what you were asking for, could you respond in a logical fashion based on the questions? Could you respond in a logical fashion based on the questions? We get RFP sometimes or requests for information, RFIs as well, that, that we look at each other going, I don't know what they're asking for or what they're asking for makes absolutely no sense. So when they get the response back, they have more questions. So step back and look at it and go, if this was me and I had to respond as a consultant, A, I could either, you know what, it makes absolute sense or B, we got to work on it so it make, does make sense. Okay, be clear on dates and stick to them, okay? Be clear on dates and stick to them. This is a real, real problem. Please remember, as consultants, we are spending, you know, when we do big responses, we could be taking... 30, 40 hours of our time, not just me, but like a, that engagement uh, that we won in Bahrain, that was three of us, three of us working on this massive proposal. And when you're, when you, again, put all this time in, that's basically free time. We're very thankful for the, for the potential to respond. But again, it does take up a lot of our time. We're looking for clients to be very clear on dates, such as, you know what, when is uh, dates that you really need to let us know? When do we need to let you know that we're going to participate? When are questions from us due to you? When will responses to questions be sent to all vendors? So not only did we tell you when we were, we were going to respond, we sent our questions in on the right due date, but we know when we're going to get responses back so we can review those questions, right? So we can say, gosh, we're on track or we're way off and we, we need to realign ourselves. When is a request for proposal due? Here's what really makes me mad about requests for proposals sometimes when they're due. We have responded, again, on time, on schedule. And there'll be other vendors that are allowed then to, you know what? Oh, I didn't. they didn't meet the deadline, so we're going to extend the deadline. All right? One last thing I do want to say before I forget. If you've already made a decision on who you want to choose, and you're only doing the RFP because you have to get three, find a way not to make waste everybody's time. All right, I've been there before uh, where it's very clear that, again, they're doing this just to run through the, uh, you know, just to run through it because they have to. Do whatever you can to make it as easy as possible because it's a waste of time for everybody. Uh, it really is. Also, when are the presentations from the finalists? So once they're due and you do your review, when are you going to let the finalists know and when will the final presentations be required to be conducted? Okay, very important because, again, Typically, MHA, we've been blessed that we're typically always in the finals or very uh, most majority, if not all the time, we make it to the final final uh, finalist presentations. So it's really important you know when that is so you can get your people scheduled so you can at least prepare them if you need them for that time frame, if you need more than one on the final presentation. And then lastly, when are you going to make the award notification? When are you going to make that final award notification? Uh, that is really important. And then uh, at the final also, what is the timeline to start and end? So in your RFP should have that. I tell you what, probably one of the worst was a, was a very global, truly well-known fashion company, truly known fashion company. Um, and MHA responded. Uh, their RFP was a disaster. We ended up, they actually wanted everything in PowerPoint and we ended up with a 60 page PowerPoint, right? We get through that phase. We make it to the finals. We travel all the way to New York City. Um, they're late for the presentation. Uh, don't give us any time back. So our, our presentation got cut down to 40 minutes that we had to adapt on the fly. And guess what? When we're all done, did our presentation, said our thank yous left. They never notified anybody if they won, who won or lost. So you can see, again, all this is so important that you understand what you want 
what, what you don't want, and then what dates every, all of this is going to fall on. All right. Communicate the same message to all prospective clients, consultants, excuse me. You need to have one clear message that always goes out to all potential vendors. You shouldn't be sending different messages to different vendors when you get to the point of, you've, you know, here's the RFP, here's a quest, you when to send questions. So remember, so when consultants send questions on the RFP, all the combined questions and answers should be sent in one communication to everybody. I shouldn't just get my questions. I should, they, everybody should get mine and I should get theirs. We should understand what everybody's asking. Here's what that does for you. By doing that, we can see what everybody else is asking. And most importantly, what that does is you get a better response because I may have forgotten the questions. I see another firm ask and I'm like, holy cow. Or at times I'm like, there've been times that we're the only ones asking questions. And you're like, wow, is it because some of the other firms don't want to respond because it's such a mess uh, or they just don't care? Um, so again, make sure everybody should get all the questions and answers from all the consultants. You don't, we do not want to know who they are, but we should at least see what those questions and responses are. All right. So everyone should have access to the same information. In the end, it'll give you a better RFP response. Now, very important too, when you respond back to the consultants with your one message, whatever that may be, hey, we need to have an extended time to get this done in. Um, we've been delayed. Just make sure you blind copy everybody. Be very careful because we've actually had RP responses where they put, they put, they forget and the courtesy copy, put it on the courtesy copy. We now know everybody that's responding. So that in a lot of cases, we've all, you know, again, or competed against each other. We all know everybody's rates. We all know everybody's weaknesses and strengths. And we can play on that by knowing who that is. So very important, make sure you blind copy everybody. So we don't know when you send these messages out to all the consultants, we don't know who that is. And again, that gives you a, a much better playing field. All right. Communicate the status of selection and a very clear message to the winner and those that don't win. Let us know. You know, when you've done this for so long, you're not going to win them all. So you don't take it personally. Uh, and if possible, tell people why you didn't select them. If they're a solid firm with a solid brand, they don't take this personally. You know what? You're not going to win at all. Sometimes your price could be too much. Maybe you're off on hours. Maybe they just like the way somebody talked that day. It's okay. And it's okay to know because all of us, honestly, if you're really good at what you're trying to, you know, you're trying to do as a consultant, you want to know why and you want to know how you can make your process better. You know, I'm not going to come back and say, hey, you know what? I, I'm, I'm really upset. How could you possibly do this? I should have won. It is what it is. But it's nice to just kind of know, hey, potentially it's nice when somebody says, you know, we really liked everything you had, but it all came down to your price. Or, you know what? We needed a bigger firm. OK, that's fine as well. But if you can, let people know why. All right. When in doubt, get help. There's been a number of clients that, guess what? They only hired us to help them write the RFP. And that's okay. They had complex RFPs or they didn't had no clue what they're doing. And they honestly saw the value in us just helping them write their RFP. Okay. So by doing that, you know, if you don't feel adequately prepared to write the RFP, get someone who knows the field to help you sort out what you need. This will really help devise an RFP that, other BC consultants that will understand and can respond to with confidence and detail. So it's kind of like, you know, a lot of times it's like you, me trying to write my own contract. I'd rather have my legal team and my legal team here to, to help me look at what I have, make changes, spend the money up front, because in the end, it protects me. You got to think that way. Make sure then if you really are in doubt, just get some help. Hey, you got 40 hours to help me write this proposal. When you're going to spend six figures, or even you know, eighty, hundred thousand dollars, fifty thousand. If you spend five, ten thousand dollars on some help, making sure this does your does your RFP look good to help somebody at least look at it, give you give you some uh, semblance of, of hey, it looks good or not. It's going to save you a lot of money in the back end and a lot of pain. Final presentations. Holy cow! Please tell us what you actually expect in these presentations, Michael. You you and your team have. 45 minutes, and here's how we expect you to break up those 45 minutes. And we want you to start here, and we want you to make sure by the time you finish, you've covered these three to five areas. All right, and please be on time and be engaged. Please be on time and be engaged. 
There's nothing worse today. I was on a presentation. One of the gentlemen, the gentleman was outstanding. He made sure he was fully engaged during the whole time. He even had to leave and go pick up his kid at school, but he stayed on to, so he could make sure he could ask questions. The other two on the final presentation, not a question, nothing. So be on time and be engaged. Because remember, we've spent all this time creating this response. So it's nice when you're engaged and ask questions. Uh, you know, you don't want to hear crickets. You're doing your best to provide all the information. You're doing your best to provide how you're going to do it, what the estimated investment is. At least ask some questions and be engaged. That's very helpful and considerate and kind. Because remember, our time is valuable too, too, as, uh, too as well. So remember that. Remember, our time is valuable as well. And we know you've probably been on three or four of these and you're probably tired, right? But at least be engaged, ask some questions and, and understand that. Be kind. I know that seems kind of like, why are you even saying that? Well, I'll tell you, I have been, this is a really funny, funny story. I uh, received this RFP from a very well-known media company. And their RFP was an absolute disaster. It made absolutely no sense. Couldn't understand it. Uh, so I, I uh, sent the, the individual who was head of procurement a question. And this individual responded with, you know what, if you really knew what you were doing in the industry, you wouldn't be asking me that question. So I've reached a point in my career and in the life cycle of our consulting firm that I quickly sent him an email and said, thank you very much, but no thank you. Uh, we wish you your best. Here's what the interesting part is. Then I had an individual who actually come, came to work with me. He was a really good consultant. And we were talking about this exact issue with, with, with RFPs. And I said, there was this media company uh, that, that did this and his firm actually ended up working for him. And it actually ended up being one of the worst engagements he ever was on. And it was very clear how rude they were. It was very clear how difficult they were gonna be to work with. And I'm so glad I made the right decision. So be kind, be kind in these final presentations or when people ask you for information or questions. All right. Make sure you read the consultant's response so you understand, you know, here's our final presentation. Understand how we're, we're trying to respond to your request for proposal. Highlight it. You don't have to read every line, but highlight the key points so that you can ask questions or you have an idea of why we're saying what we're saying. OK, and also very important, I will tell you this, the people who do this really well and really call the list of who they want. When we come to the final presentation, it's not about me telling you anymore who our clients are, or what our experience is, all of those things we, that you already know, you feel confident. Just tell me how you're going to attack what I need you to do. Uh, be on camera. Talking to dead air is a real pain. I do that a lot. I do that a lot in conferences. I do that a lot in just day to day. Be on camera so I can see you, uh, please. It's just very helpful. Uh, let me know. Do you need additional information from me? Tell me what it is so I can send it at the end of the presentation, uh, very importantly. Uh, and then at the end, please tell us, hey, thank you for your time. Here's the timelines and here's what the selection process is going to be. So I can write that down and, and add that to my opportunity pipeline so I know what's going to happen. Very important. All right. In summary, remember, select relevant vendors to you first. Go out there. Don't just, you know, because a lot of times people will just do, you know what, they'll do like a shotgun approach. They end up with 10 vendors, seven, five to seven, 10, and it becomes a disaster. Go out, spend the time. Pick those that you say, I've got the top three. Here's the top three I like, I've done my work, and that's going to make your process a lot better. So you can get rid of all the minutia you're going to want to be asking in the RP because you already know you feel confident with who they are. Number two, make sure it makes sense. If you look at yourself and you couldn't respond to it, start over. Or spend the time and hire somebody to help you with a few hours to at least look at it and say, you're on the right track. In your RFP, please tell me what the scope is. That is how big or not big it is. How, when do you need to start? When do you need to finish? What are the dates? Everything from when I need to tell you when I'm going to participate all the way to final selection. Make sure your format is easy to respond to. Don't make it into a death march. Make sure the, the format makes sense, that you're asking the right things. Tell me what the summary of the engagement's gonna be. Tell me what your approach is gonna be. What's the timeline to get it done? What's it gonna cost me? And, and any references as well as what team members you may wanna use. But remember, team members can change because if you take too long to make selections, 
my team, my, I know our team, they're busy. I can't always put the person on engagement if you take too long. And then lastly, have a consistent communication plan to your potential vendors. Have a good, solid communication plan that's consistent and fair to everybody involved. And then lastly, those final presentations mean everything. Make sure they're well uh, outlined, you're engaged, you ask questions, you're kind, and you let us know at the end what you need, as well as when you're going to make your final decisions. Here's a final point. Remember this. After doing this for so long, I've reached the point, I want to also pick what clients I want to, uh, my, our firm wants to work for. Okay, we have honestly reached that point. because So when we're going through this, we're also trying to determine, do we want to work for you or not? You know, that's now a luxury that we have as MHA. It wasn't when we first started. We want to work for clients where it is a partnership. It is a partnership and we work together to build a program that makes sense, that's executable, it's quality work. So remember that as well. We're also determining if we want to work for you. If those firms will do anything and jump through hoops for you, I'd be a little leery. Because remember, this is a, in today's world, we're such in a complex environment. You need a partnership. We, we're not a commodity. We're a partnership and we're a trusted advisor. I want to thank everybody for their time today. Uh, I think it, hopefully this will help you in your RFPs and making sure you provide one that makes sense. And most importantly, gets you the right consulting team and the services and goods and technology you may need in order to make your continuity program reach a new level of sophistication and, and capability. We look forward to you again attending uh, our next leadership uh, series coming up here in the next quarter. And again, Michael Herrera from MHA Consulting, we thank you for your time. We thank you for your willingness to listen and we hope this helps. And please feel at any time always to get in touch with me. Uh, that's Herrera at MHA-IT.com or you can reach me at 888-689-2290. Thank you everyone and have a great day.